cross before me, the world behind, no turning back, raise the banner high, it's not for me, it's all for you. Let the heavens shake and split the sky, let the people clap their hands and cry, it's not for us. It's all for you, not to us, but to your name be the glory, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Before your throne, the only place for those who know it's not for us, it's all for you. Send your holy fire on this offering, let our worship burn for the world to see. It's not for us. Bye. 
invited us to come. You've reassured us with your love. As a family, cherishing your presence, Lord, we boldly the window of your word. We come to understand your word. In humble majesty, revealing in the face of Christ, your glory Your whisper 
just whispers of how great you are. Give the world its all that it was good. You sent your only son for you are. Close around 
we come and we come to you Lord because we know the only true life is in you and Lord we choose to build our life upon you Lord Lord upon the rock of the truth of the gospel Lord we build our life that you are who you say you are and that you've done what you've said you've done Lord in your word Lord we believe it Lord Help us to live it more and more. Help us to show it, Lord, more and more. And we thank you, Lord. We praise you. Receive our worship, Lord. For it's in the name that is above all names, the only name given among men by which we must be saved, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, that all God's people say, Amen. Amen. At this time, let's go ahead and stand. Uh, the youth reminding you you'll be with us
Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Lord, we, we do want to be overcome by your presence. We want to sense And be aware that you are here, that you're ministering, that you're touching hearts and touching lives. Lord, I know that you inhabit the praises of your people. I know that you enjoy, Lord, when we pour out our heart to you. And I know that, Lord, you hear our prayers. Thank you. And we look forward to what you're going to do this morning. And we just pray for your blessing upon the teaching of your word now. And Lord, we lift it to you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. We're going to go a little farther this morning than our reading. Um, We'll be going into the next chapter, chapter 21, and going over the triumphal entry of Christ into uh, Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. But here in this chapter, by way of reminder, we're on our way to Jerusalem. Jesus has spoken to his disciples, and he told them, he says, look, he says, we're going to Jerusalem, and there I'm going to be turned over to the leaders, and they are going to crucify me, and I am going to be buried for three days, and then I'm going to rise from the dead. And being great men of passion and understanding and concerned about others they said well which one of us is going to sit next to you on the right and on the left you know let's get past the beating and the scourging and the crucifying and all that kind of stuff which one of us is going to be there you know that's really kind of the heart of all of this isn't it it's always about us and not about others I, I always I marvel at that, to be honest with you. I'm sitting there thinking, okay, he's telling you guys something that's very important, and they're just not grasping it. So we're on our way there. We're going through Jericho, and that's where we find these two men who are blind. It says, now as they, in verse 29 of chapter 20, now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed them. This great multitude would have been on their way to Jerusalem as well. It's going to be Passover week in Jerusalem. And so you have just thousands and thousands in in some estimations that Jerusalem would grow to almost a million people uh, during the high holidays, and especially on Passover. And so you would have these throngs of people on their way from all over Israel. It was required by every Jewish male that he would attend the Passover feast in Jerusalem. And so three times a year they were required to go up, and so they would. And so this is why you have this multitude that is coming along, and they're following Jesus as he's making his way there. And as they're coming through Jericho, it says, and behold, two blind men sitting by the road Uh, When they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. So here, on Jesus' way to Jerusalem, he's going to really give us that that final display of his authority in that he's going to heal these two blind men. And it'll be the last miracle that he performs uh, in, in demonstrating his power and his authority Uh, and as to who he was. Um, Jesus heals the two blind men near the city of Jericho. Mark and Luke repeat this story with a few differences. Matthew wrote of two men. Mark and Luke only speak of one. Mark included the name of the blind man, which is Bartimaeus. Undoubtedly, two men were there, and Bartimaeus was more noticeable of the two. Matthew and Mark said that the men were healed when Jesus left Jericho, but Luke said the healing occurred when Jesus approached Jericho. Oh, no. What do we do? That's a a discrepancy. There's a problem. 
somebody's lying. You know, we po pointed out yesterday when I was teaching up at the men's retreat that there are some people that say they can't believe the, the, uh, the Gospels because they were written by fishermen. And you know how fishermen are. They lie. But, you know, it's like I, I said, it's, a, you know, what they fail to remember and to realize is that only one fisherman wrote one of the Gospels, and one of them was a tax collector, and I would believe a fisherman over a tax collector any day of the week. Here we have these two men. We have what appears to be a discrepancy, and it's kind of interesting that, you know, the Scripture declares these things, and then People doubt it. They try to find these things that are wrong with the word, and then along comes archaeology. And what it does is it unearths the truth. And that's what happened. For many years, they did not know that there were actually two Jerichos at this time. There was the old Jericho and the new Jericho. And so it is that Jesus is actually leaving the new Jericho and entering into the old Jericho. So he's doing both. He's, in, he's leaving and he's entering. And so it's, there is no discrepancy. And what I have found usually when it comes to the Word of God, if I think that there's something that's wrong, all I need to do is dig a little bit deeper and I'll find out that there's not. The truth will always come to the surface. So here we have these two guys that are there. And uh, in verse 31 it tells us, that the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What, would you, uh, what do you want me to do for you? you know, by using the title, the Son of David, they were appealing to him as the Messiah. And we see that often in the Gospels with people who are in a predicament. They're in a situation. They're, they're lame. They're blind. Uh, you know, the, the deaf. Uh, there is that reference and the understanding of who Jesus really is. They recognize it. They know who Jesus is. And so they call out to him on the basis of that. It's like, no, you're the Messiah. You're the promised one. Now, at this point, you know, nobody realizes that Jesus is God, at least very few. And, and so when they're making this statement, they're, they're knowing of what the Messiah is, who he is, and what he's going to do. The Old Testament prophecy said that what he would do is that he would, he would open the eye, you know, give sight to the blind and open the ears of the deaf. He would heal the sick. He would make the lame walk. And so every person who would find themselves in this kind of condition, they would be looking for that person, for that man who was the Messiah, because they knew the hope of the healing that was there, the potential that is there. And so they make this reference to him as the Messiah. They know who he is. And at least this part, they, they have this earnest expectation, this earnest hope that Jesus truly is the Messiah because they're looking to be healed. And of course, uh, Jesus is going to grant their request to them. And we see here also that they persist in spite of the rebuke from the crowd until Jesus stopped and calls out to them. They didn't give up. Now, I think there are things that we can learn, you know, from them. And that is this, that that persistence, the pursuit of Jesus in our own heart and our own lives should be consistent with guys like this. The desperation. You know, I remember when I got saved, I was desperate. I, you know, my life was a mess, and, and I was quickly realizing that my life was a mess, and it was actually more of a mess than what I did realize. But out of desperation, I called to the Lord. And the Lord heard me. He came into my heart. He saved me. He began to change my life. The problem sometimes with believers is that we lose that sense of desperation in our relationship with God. It becomes routine. Uh, sometimes as we begin to doubt in the sense that we don't have that earnest expectation that God is going to work and do in our life as, as we call upon him to do. 
Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I know that God does not heal everyone. If he did, there wouldn't be a sick person in this church, right? Because we've been praying for those who are a part of our family, a part of our fellowship. Any person who's ill, we're more than happy to pray for them, to ask God to heal. Because we do believe that God heals and we have an expectation that he will if it is his will. But that's the whole thing, was we have to, we don't want to lose that hope. We don't want to lose that heart that has an expectation that God is going to work. But we do. And sometimes it's because we do pray and we don't see it happen, so then we just become, you know, really doubtful if that's what the Lord is really going to do. Yeah, I'm going to pray, but when actually we should pray believing that God will but, you know, we say, Lord, your will be done, not because it's an excuse that if he doesn't do what we ask, that it's like, oh, it's okay. But it's the truth. It's what we want. We want the Lord's will. And we don't always know what that is. We don't always understand and know that what God is going to do is the best for us. I had the opportunity to pray with a man yesterday who know of a couple, and they're elderly, and the man is uh, declining very quickly. He's suffering from dementia, and he's having a, 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 him and his wife are having a very difficult time with it all. And he said, you know, I just want to pray for them. My heart goes out to them. I said, great, let's pray for them. And the, the thing that I told him, I said, what we may not understand is that the best thing that we can pray is, Lord, take this brother home. Take this brother home. Because that's where his healing is going to be ultimately found. And when he is there, he'll be, dra he'll be dancing in the streets. And he'll be rejoicing. But, of course, our heart says, no, no, do it here. Because we still want that person to be here. But God knows what is best. And so we leave it in his care. We leave it in his hands. Obviously, in this case here, what these guys, what God's will was, is that Jesus was going to heal them. There was a purpose in that. Like I said, this is the last time that Jesus will exercise uh, his power in such a way that it demonstrates his authority and who he really is. With each one of these things that, that Jesus would do, it is just one more little statement about who he was to those who doubted him. We'll see in a moment as we're looking at the triumphal entry we won't in Matthew's gospel, but in Luke's gospel, it points out that as the people are crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that the leaders, they tell them, hey, tell your disciples to stop shouting that. Because the people were saying, this is the Messiah, this is the Messiah. And they said, you tell them to quit saying that because we don't believe it's true. Even though Christ had demonstrated himself to be the one who was foretold would come to the extent that he rose Lazarus from the dead and even with that that was not enough to convince them as a matter of fact they hardened their hearts to the degree that after seeing that they said you know what this is going to ruin us we need to put this man to death we need to get rid of him and poor Lazarus him too. He gets to die twice. Remember what I always say, right? If I fall over dead, don't bring me back, I'll kill you. I only want to die once. That's it. It's over. I'm, I'm there. Leave me alone. God, God's will. That's right. It is God's will. <laughs> there you go. You have it. So this is just one more one more thing, one more demonstration. Not that Jesus is trying to put on some kind of a show. He's not. But he wants them to know. He wants people to be convinced as to who he is so that they would receive him as their Messiah. Just as he does today. He wants to convince people of that. Here we have two blind men. And Jesus is going to open their eyes. Verse 33 and they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Jesus is still opening the eyes of the blind today. 
And it's, it's amazing to me to watch people and to see God working in their lives in, in miraculous ways many times. And there are things that it's so clear that God is trying to touch them. God is trying to reach them. He's trying to open their eyes. But yet, they refuse to see. I've got a, a gentleman that I know that, that I have been praying for, that I have been trying to witness to with success as far as witnessing. But the problem is, is that it goes in one ear and right out the other with no, no slowing down between the two. There, there's no understanding. There's no grasping these things. And, and it's very frustrating to be honest with you. But I understand. I, I know the God of this world has his mind blinded. That's what it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It, that, that there's this problem that he has with the, the, the enemy of our souls stopping it from resting between the two ears and catching a hold. And so I have to pray. Lord, please open his eyes. You know, God's certainly not done because I still have this relationship with him. I see him five times a week when I go to the gym. There's opportunities. And it, every opportunity I get, I share with him again. Finally making some headway where I'm going over to his house and working on his motorcycle for him. So there's things that are happening, but boy, this is a slow-moving train if I ever saw one. But God is still able to open the eyes for people to see. And when we look out in the world that surrounds us right now, I think that you guys would agree with me that we see lots and lots and lots of people that are blinded to the things of God. So much so for many of them, uh, they are, they're antagonistic toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's how blinded they are. They can't see the good. They can't see the one who has come to save their soul from hell. And they see him as an imposition upon their lifestyle. That if there is a God, then that means I must live in some way that pleases Him rather than myself. The God of this world, He has blinded many eyes. But greater, greater is God. And God can. And you know what? Here's the, here's the thing. God uses us and He puts us in these people's lives so that we can get close to them in order to be able to share the truth about who Jesus is. Because if we don't, how will they know and how will they hear? Well, I'll tell you how they'll know and how they'll hear. They'll hear it on the news and they'll hear it on Facebook or read it on Facebook. They'll see all the lies. They'll see all the deception and they'll buy into it. They'll buy into it. But what they need to have is they need to have someone who has the light to shine upon the deeds of of darkness in their life that they might be revealed to them to know the truth. God has given us this wonderful, glorious pleasure and blessing to be able to do that with people. We get to be that person that demonstrates the love of Christ to individuals. And we encounter people all the time, all week long, we do. We all encounter people at different times. Unless you're staying in the house and going nowhere, you are encountering people. So then it comes down to this. Are we open and willing to let God use us in that way? That we would be that light to others around us. That we would be that testimony about God to those who are blinded. Do we be, are we so bold as to pray, Lord, would you please give me an opportunity today to share the gospel with somebody? Would you do that, Lord? I venture to say most of us don't. I venture to say that God wishes we will. All we have to do is be willing, and he'll do it through us because that's what he has called us to. You see, he's still removing the blindness from people's eyes. All of you in here this morning as Christians have had that blessed 
experience with God, that he revealed himself to you in such a way that you realize that, yes, this is what I need in my life. But he didn't give that to us that we might hide it under a bushel, but that we'd let the light of Christ shine through us in such a way that others might see. So let's go on over to chapter 21, and we'll be going from verses 1 through 11. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. It's a short distance from Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany. At that point, he stopped until the way could be prepared so that when he entered the city, people would know he was presenting himself as the Messiah. His command to two of his disciples was to find a colt and bring it here. Jesus was fulfilling Zechariah 9, 9, and 10, which predicted the Messiah would ride on a donkey. In Zechariah 9, 9, and 10, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from the sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So here we see that Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy. He's going to be coming in on the foal of a donkey. In Exodus chapter 13 and verse 13, it says this about the donkey. It says, But every firstborn of the donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall Redeem. It's interesting to me that in the Old Testament that, that the Lord put such an emphasis on this beast of burden, the, the donkey, that it was because of the prophecy that, that the Messiah would come, that it had this great importance and credence. You catch the, the correlation there that not only uh, are you to redeem that donkey, the male donkey, uh, with a lamb, but also your firstborn child, your firstborn son. You were to do the same. And that's a pretty huge significance. You see, there's a lot of things that really relate to us with this donkey. And I'm not trying to be funny, by the way. First of all, he was redeemed by a lamb. And so are we. He had to be released because Jesus said, when you go get him, release him. Loose it and bring it to me. He had to be ruled. No one had ever ridden him, so he had to be broken. He had to go where Jesus wanted to go. He had to do what Jesus wanted him to do. So, let me ask the question. Are you as smart as a donkey? You should say yes, right? Right? I'm willing to admit that God spoke through a donkey to Balaam and that he speaks to you every Sunday through a donkey as well. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm not afraid to say I'm as smart as a donkey. Okay? Are you? Are you as smart as a donkey? If you know Christ, you have been redeemed by the Lamb of God, just like the donkey had been. You have been released from the bonds of your sin, just like the donkey had to be set for, loose in order to come. Are you willing to go where Jesus wants you to go? Well, that's what the, you know, the donkey really didn't, we don't see that when they brought him to Jesus and he got on the donkey and he began to ride, the donkey didn't argue with him. You see, the donkey was smart. The donkey knew his master, even though he just met him. He knew his master. And he knew there was no need, no reason to argue with the master. And so he simply obeyed. Isn't it amazing how some of the simplest of God's life that he has created 
has no problem whatsoever understanding, knowing, and realizing the God of the universe. It's only us. The one that he gave the free will to. You know? There were the ones that have the problem. We want to argue with him. When he says, go here, go there, do this, do that. Well, you know, it's kind of un- inconvenient for me in my life to do that. I think I'd rather do X, Y, and Z. You know, when I tell you guys these things, you know who I have in mind first most? Me. Because that's how I have been in my life. I look back on my life and think about the years I didn't know God. And I won't say that I purposed in my heart to rebel and to go the opposite direction that God would have me go because I really did not have an understanding or knowledge of it. But having, having come to Christ, then there was that wrestling match that I had with the Lord often. Go here, Bob. No, I don't want to go there. Do this. No, I don't want to do that. Well, if you do this, you know you're going to be a lot better off. No, I don't think so. Only to get in the middle of the quicksand to find out, Lord, I wish I'd have listened to you. I wish I'd have gone where you told me to go rather than going where I'm going right now. Only to find that the Lord is faithful. That when I'm in the middle of that quicksand that he reaches down and he pulls me up, snatches me out of the, of the situation that I place myself in. But I've been in that enough times to know that the best thing to do is just simply obey and and god gives us a dumb animal as an example of of what it's supposed to be no argument go where you're supposed to go do whatever god wants you to do i hope you are as smart as the donkey it makes me mad you know when when i'm not as smart as a donkey you guys know what I say about onions, right? Well, it's real simple. God gave gophers enough sense not to eat onions. And I figure I'm as smart as a gopher. So that makes you that eat onions dumber than a gopher. That's all I can say. <laughs> Ain't got the sense God gave a gopher. Right? How did I go there? That was bad. <laughs> all I can say is sleep deprivation, you know? It's been a long week. Truth is, is that we just, we want to be that, that simple individual that's willing to follow and do whatever God wants us to do. Not to argue with Him, you know. You can argue with Him all you want, but there's one thing for sure. He's always going to win. Verse 3, it says, And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of him, and immediately he will send them. There's a whole lot of discussion about whether or not Jesus had arranged for this beforehand or if it was supernatural. Supernatural. You know, I have a, I have a tendency to lean towards supernatural. I do. Uh, I, I, I do believe that there are times when God speaks to people in such a way that it's very clear to them. They know, oh, this is the Lord. And so I'm going to do this because I hear the voice of the Lord and I'm going to do it unquestioningly. That's the thing I marvel at is that, that the guy's willing to do it and he doesn't argue about it. You see, it really doesn't matter though whether it's supernatural or it has been predetermined and Jesus had set it up. Um, It is that when called upon, the individual was willing and he willingly gave it for the Lord's use. And and really, that's what I see here with this is that that the things that that he had, he was willing that if it was either supernatural or if it had been prearranged, that he was willing to use it for God's glory, for the Lord. Matter of fact, that's what Jesus told him. He says, if anybody questions you, just tell them the Lord needs it. And as a matter of fact, one of the other Gospels tells us, yes, they they did question him. And he indeed did. Okay, there you go. How about us? Do we argue when the Lord makes a demand on something that belongs to us? Yes, you have said. I give you my life, everything I have. But now when he makes a specific request, then we balk at it. 
Anything in your life, anything that you own, any possession that you have that's so great that if God asked you to give it up, you would say no? My advice is hold on to everything that you have with loose, loose hands. That way God never has to pry it out of your hands, but he simply takes it out whenever he wants it or needs it, whatever that may be. Uh, it's really kind of interesting. The last couple of months, really struggling a lot with uh, my, this loss of my son. Yeah, I don't know why, just a lot of emotion in my heart and stuff. It's been 35 years since that took place, and that's a long time. And to be honest with you, there's been a lot of healing in my heart where it really hasn't been an issue. I don't understand why, though, the last couple of months, I've really struggled a lot with it. I go to the same God who gave me comfort then to give me comfort now, too. So I don't want you to get the wrong idea, right? It's just that it comes up, and I, and I don't know where it's coming from. But the same God that gave me comfort then gives me comfort now. But believe me, I was very, very, very mindful of the fact that my child did not belong to me. He belonged to the Lord. And God had the right to take him any time that he said was the time. I didn't have a choice in that matter. He didn't even ask my opinion. And what I had to do was embrace it and accept it as being from the Lord. Anything that we have, whether it is someone who is near and dear to us or if it is our possessions, let us not hold on to it so tightly that when it goes that it brings us to destruction. There are many people who having lost a loved one whether it is a child or spouse or mother or father, or brother, or sister, whoever it is, that when that happens, that it destroys them in their life. I have met people who, with those experiences, really are, they are crippled. They're debilitated. They are unable to function in life because of the grief. I understand grief. It's a very destructive thing in our lives. It's a very natural thing that we feel when somebody that we know and love leaves our presence. But we turn to the God of all comforts who comforts us with all comfort that we have need of in our time of need. And we should be able to continue on. I'm not saying that we forget them or that, you know, we don't have our struggles with it. I shared with you what's happening to me over the last couple of months. You do, but you turn to God and you say, Lord, look, he, he was, I say, I say, he was yours. And I'm grateful that he was yours, that I will see him again. Probably sooner than I know, right? I turn 65 tomorrow. I'm going to be old. That's right. Who said that? It's official. Tomorrow, it's official. I will be old. Oh, hope. No, I don't hope. I don't, if I don't make 65, I'm going to be okay with that. If he takes me between now and tomorrow morning, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Just remember that. <laughs> David Guzik had this to say about... Uh, Regarding the instructions about obtaining the donkey, he said, we are to obey Jesus when he tells us to do something just because we don't understand how everything will work, uh, how it will work out. is no reason to refuse to budge when it's time to obey. Are you like that with the Lord or with anything, right? I find people like that. I'm real bad. I don't, uh, I don't plan well. You know, I say, okay, we're going to do this. They say, well, how are we going to do it? I said, we're just going to do it. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. We're just going to do it. God surrounds me with people that say, well, look, we need to do this. We need to do that. We need to do that. And I say, that sounds real good. Looks like we're going to do it. That's okay with me. But that's kind of how I am with the Lord, too. The Lord tells me to do something. I don't, I don't have, he doesn't have to give me the full plan on how it's going to happen. I just figure he's going to tell me to put one foot in front of the other, and when we get to the end of the road, I'll know exactly what his plan was. Here are the disciples. They're called to do that. You go over there, and you go get that donkey, and you bring him back here to me. He didn't tell them, because we're going to, I'm going to ride that donkey into Jerusalem, and it's going to be a testimony to God. I'm going to fulfill the prophecy in Zechariah. And, you know, he didn't do all that. 
He just told him this, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified. What's a donkey got to do with it, you know? Are, are you like that? Do you have to have, and if you do, that's okay. I'm not saying that you guys need to be like me. That's just what makes up the, the, the wonderful colorfulness of the body of Christ, isn't it? Because we're all so different. We, we, we have different gifts and callings and we work together in order to make up the whole of the body, each part working together in order to be able to make it all work the way it should. Aren't you glad God surrounds me with people that are that way? Otherwise it'd be nuts. You guys would show up on Sunday morning and I'd go, hey, we're just going to do it. But there are others that got it figured out. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that we should not just simply obey God. If you, if you are if you sat down and say, you know what, no, I'm not budging till you give me the whole plan, Lord, then you're probably not going to get anywhere. Real quickly, because I'm running out of time here. When I was called to go to, uh, God had told me that I was going to be a pastor, and he gave me the scripture to show me that, and then he told me I was to leave where I was living, and I was to move back to Southern California, go to school. So I told the Lord, I said, great, what four-year college am I going to? That, that would have been a joke if I'd have ended up in a four-year college. I'd have never made it. No, no I, Seriously, I, I would not. Academically, I would not have been able to do it. And the Lord spoke to my heart, and he says, you're going to go to school for three years. I thought, well, that's weird. Most colleges I know of, you go to your, you know, two or four. There is no three-year plan you know, in most of them. And he said, just trust me on this. Okay. So what college am I going to? You're going to go to Calvary Chapel, West Covina, to their Bible school. Okay, great. I get there. They got a one-year program. Okay, okay. So maybe it's one year here and two years at a college somewhere. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Long story short, although my stories always end up being long. Uh, by the time I got through with the first year, they started a second-year program. And when I finished the second year, it took a year for it, but they had already told me they were starting a third year. And so we were there, and I went through the first two years, waited a year, and then ended up going through the third year. At the end of the third year program, I went out from there to start a church. Exactly the way the Lord said it was going to happen. But what he didn't give me was all the details from the point of you're going to go to school, you're going to go to school for three years. You're going to go to Calvary Chapel Bible College at West Covina. Well, it doesn't compute, Lord. I don't see this one-year program. How does that work? And just, you know, all the time, Lord, how is this going to Don't worry about it. Just trust me. So I did. That's how God is able to work with me because I'm not one of those that has to have all the all things laid out for me. And, and I would challenge you to being open enough that God could work that way in your life too if you are that type of person that has to have everything planned out for you. Because sometimes God just doesn't do that. Sometimes he does. And I'm glad for you guys because you got to have that. I don't. I, I, I like being fancy, free, and footloose and all that kind of stuff. And just, they're just going to do it. It works. Also, he had this to say, we must be ready and willing for Jesus to claim use of our possessions and positions. Since he is our master, they don't belong to us, but to him. And when he sends a message, the Lord has need of it. We must relinquish our control willingly and immediately. Everything that we have belongs to the Lord. Keep your hand open with all of your stuff, whatever it is, position, you know, whatever it may be. Keep your hand open. Let God take out whatever he wants. He'll put in whatever he wants. And at the end of the day, you'll be blessed, I guarantee. Now, uh, verse 4, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a, on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus would ride this colt into Jerusalem. It was important that it wasn't a horse because that would send the message that Jesus was a man of war. He's coming back on a horse. In Revelation, it tells us that he will return on a white horse. There's a, there's a clear message that is being stated there with that. And that is when he comes back the second time, it is as a man of war, as the victor. The first time he came, he came as a man of peace. 
He came to bring peace between God the Father and all of mankind. That was his job. That's why he came in on the foal of a donkey. He came in as the prince of peace. And that's the statement that's made by him riding that donkey. This is why it was important for the donkey to be obedient to the, to the Lord. Verse 6, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on it. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. They praised Jesus with whatever they had using simple things like palm branches. John's Gospel says this, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast. Remember I said they're, they're heading towards Jerusalem for the Passover. So there's this great multitude is there. And when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem... Uh, took branches of palm trees and went out and met him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They took what they had. They took their clothes. They took branches from palm trees and they laid them down on the, on the road so that when the donkey went over them that its feet did not touch the ground. Jesus doesn't need great things to give him honor. He doesn't. All he needs is just the simple things that we have in our life that we offer back to him. You may feel that you don't have a great voice or a heart or a life, but give it to him and praise him with it, and he will be satisfied. It doesn't matter. You know, it's really easy to judge ourselves among ourselves and to think that what I have is inadequate for the Lord because I see something else that somebody has whether it's a gift, a talent, a possession whatever it may be and we think to ourselves, well man it might, what I have is really nothing at all Wednesday night we were in 2 Corinthians going through chapters 28 or 20, I'm sorry, 8 and 9 and 10 but we spoke about the whole thing about giving to the Lord and using as an example as that it has to be from the heart, the woman who gave the two mites, who gave of everything that she had. As far as value goes, the two mites were worthless. You could not buy anything for two mites. It meant nothing. But Jesus said that what she gave was more important than what the other guy just before her had given which was a great sum of money. Jesus points out that it's not the volume, it's the value of what you give and whatever it is, if you offer it to the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about money here. I'm sorry if you've drifted your mind that direction because that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just whatever you have, giving it to God, and it may seem insignificant to you like two little mites, but believe me, it's not. Whatever talent God has given you is useful to the body of Christ and to the glory of God, no matter what that is. And believe me, when we have talents, when God has given us gifts and we don't use them, then we are being disobedient to God. He gives that not for our single purpose, not for our even though we do benefit from it greatly, serving the Lord and giving Him our talents and stuff, we find that we are blessed immensely. But to not use them when God has given them is sin. It is sin. Because you're saying, you know what, I don't care. You've given it to me, but I, I don't want to do it anymore. Him to know, to do what is right and does not do it, it is sin. And we need to be willing and available to the Lord. Verse 9, Then the multitudes who went before and, and those who followed, crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, uh, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Like I would said earlier in, in Luke's gospel, when they're doing this, 
the religious leaders come to Jesus they tell him to quit saying that because they knew this was a proclamation oh hey he's the Messiah this is what was said this this is out of the Psalms and this was a messianic song Hosanna Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord they knew that it was the Messiah and that's what they were saying and so the the religious leaders say stop it tell him to quit doing that and I love Jesus's response he says, if they do, the very rocks will cry out. The very rocks. The dumb rocks have enough smarts to cry out because they know who their maker is. Like I said in verse 10, it says, and when he had, had come to, into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth, uh, from Nazareth of Galilee. So I ask the question to you this morning, who is Jesus to you? Are you, the, are you one who has received their sight? If so, then you're going to be welcome at this table this morning. If not, then you need to make yourself right with the Lord before you partake of it. Here we see that the multitude, and it's interesting to me, just to, you know, by way of observation, that we have the two guys who were blind who knew who Jesus was. Lord, Elohim, Ben David. That is God, Lord, son of David they knew but here you have the multitudes who have been following him they have seen him before he's coming into Jerusalem the testimony of all the great things he has done is there and how do they reference Jesus oh he's the prophet from Nazareth all the things that he had done all, everything that he had accomplished which screamed and said that he was the Messiah even to the point to where he had just healed two blind men in Jericho. But yet these people had missed the mark. We want to make sure that we understand who Jesus is, but understand this too, that if you say that he is the Son of God, the Savior of my heart, the Savior of my soul, the Savior of my life, then your life should reflect it. Your obedience to him should be just like that donkey. Absolute. Without question, a total surrender to Jesus Christ. That's what we need, where we need to be today. So let's pray. And we're going to, I'm going to have the fellows come forward. We're going to pass out the elements. We'll celebrate the Lord's table this morning. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word and the things that it points out to us about our own heart, our own life, and how, Lord, we need to keep ourselves in that place of surrender, of giving ourselves over to you more and more and more. Lord, I thank you that you still open the sight of the blind. I thank you, Lord, that you still heal. I thank you, Lord, that you give your, your Holy Spirit as a gift to us. I thank you, Lord, that we have the indwelling Spirit that quickens our heart to the truth of your Word. And I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us this morning. And I pray, Lord, that as we come to the table, that we would make our heart right with you. That, Lord, that if it is in that place where we find that we have not been that good donkey, that we would surrender. And if we have been, then we will rejoice. For it is a celebration of the work that you have done on the cross. And, Lord, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name.
1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul had this to say to the church in Corinth. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we lift the bread to you. Lord, we thank you for this symbol that it represents the body of Christ. Lord, perforated with holes, your hands and feet pierced, stripes upon it, the stripes that were placed upon you for our iniquity, Lord. And Lord, we recognize this as being your willingness to take our sin upon yourself that we might have eternal life. We offer this up to you, Lord, giving thanks and praise for it. Make us one with you this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Take and eat. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Lord, once again, we thank you for the cup. We do do this in remembrance of you, the symbol of your blood, Lord. Mentally, emotionally, Lord, we take it in, realizing that your blood has cleansed us, purified us, and washed us. That, Lord, that, that you desire to wash away all of our sin each and every day. Lord, we need our feet washed, and we come to you for that washing, that cleansing. We remember, Lord, the work that you've done on the cross, your blood being shed, that we might have the availability of our sins being taken away. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your word says that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we are grateful. We can honestly say eternally grateful, Lord. Thank you. Bless the cup as we take it together. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse 26, Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The Lord's Supper is a visible sermon that proclaims the message of the cross. That is, the reality of the Lord's death and also the certainty of His return, which is exactly what we look forward to. Amen? Yeah. All right, would you stand with me? Sure. Lord, how, can we, how many ways can we possibly say how good and how wonderful you are that will ever begin to reach the depth of that statement? I, I don't know. It seems like words are inadequate when it comes to praising you and trying to describe your worth, Lord, and your greatness, your faithfulness, your mercy, your grace towards us, Lord. But that's all we have. And Lord, I just pray that it would be from our hearts this morning that we would declare that we love you, that we praise you, that you would go with us as we go now, and that you would pour out your blessing, Lord, upon us that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would guide and direct each one of our steps, that you would lead us to the places where you would have us go, that we might be that light to shine, to give glory to you, and that many people would come to faith through the life that you have given us. Help us all, Lord, to be evangelists. Help us all, Lord, to be great witnesses. And Lord, when we must when we get the opportunity to even be a martyr for you, to die to ourself that we might live for you. And Father, we thank you and praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.